Thank you very much, Lindsay, for sharing your views with, uh, with the audience. Uh, now I'm going to straightforward uh, invite um, Howard Bluey, who is the director of the Harvest Plus program in the US, to share his views with, uh, with us. Thank you. I just um, I want to make two points uh, in the 10 minutes that I've been given. The first is I want to talk about the rise in food prices and what the effect of that is on micronutrient malnutrition. And then the second, I'll have the last five minutes to talk a bit about the progress that we've made with biofortification. So as we speak, a consequence of rising food prices, which Inger Anderson, Anderson talked about in her talk last night, a consequence is that as we speak, iron deficiency, zinc deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, and other mineral and vitamin dis deficiencies are getting worse in developing countries. Okay, let me, let me present some data to back that statement up. This is the, to my mind, this is the basic story of the Green Revolution. That dashed line along the middle is a 100% increase between 1965 and the year 2000. You can see that cereal production more than doubled, more than 100% increase. The blue bar at the right is population increase. It just about doubled. But if you look at those green bars, that's pulses, but it's representative of all the non-staple foods that have the highest levels of minerals and vitamins. You had increases in production, but they did not keep pace with population growth. So what happened to food prices? The rice prices, the wheat prices, which grew fast, those prices came down because production grew faster than population. But by the same token, the prices of vegetables, fruits, pulses, animal products, fish products, those prices went up because they did not keep pace with population and demand. So these are some data from rural Bangladesh. And the pie chart at the left shows how the diet um, is divided according to the energy contribution of three food groups. The food staples, the brown area, which is rice, the green, which is non-staple plant foods, and the red, which is fish and animal products. So the rice is cheap, so it provides 80% of the diet for the poor. Animal products, fish products are expensive. They provide only 3% of the energy of the poor. Now the pie chart at the right shows their food budgets, what they spend on those three food groups. So already, the rural Bangladeshis, these were data that were collected in 1990s, they're already spending a quarter of their food budget on fish and animal products, 20% of their total income on fish and animal products, even though it's only providing 3% of calories. Rice is about half of the food budget, even though it's providing 80%. OK, that was before the food price rises. That's how they were allocating their food budgets, which comprise 70 or 80% of their total income. OK, now what I've done with these pie charts is show how they, these rectangles show how they divide their budget. This is the, the, the rectangle on the left comes from the previous figure. They are spending about 25% of their total budget on non-food items, 75% on food. The money they spend on food staples and the money they spend on all the other non-staples is about equal. Now what happens when food prices rise by 50%? How do the poor react to that? Well, they keep spending, they keep eating about the same amount of rice. They don't want to reduce their rice consumption because that's what keeps them from going hungry. So what they do is 
they have to spend a lot more of their budget on food staples to keep from going hungry, to keep eating the same amount of rice or wheat or whatever the food staple is in your country. And so that leaves a lot less money left over for the non-staple foods, for the green and the red areas on the right-hand triangle. And even then, the prices are higher, so you have less money to spend and you're spent, you have to pay a higher price. So what happens is your mineral and your vitamins, your intakes go down. So we've simulated this, for example, for the Philippines, and average intakes for women on iron go from seven milligrams of iron a day down to five milligrams of iron a day. Another simulation work shows that at seven milligrams of iron a day, 70% seven, of the women are iron deficient in terms of their intakes. And after the price rise, 95% of the women are iron deficient in terms of their iron intakes. So we know that micronutrient malnutrition is getting worse as food prices have been rising. So that makes biofortification, which is putting more minerals and vitamins into the staple foods through plant breeding, that makes the argument for biofortification, I think, even more compelling. So let me talk a little bit about our progress. I don't have time to go into a lot of the details. I just have a little bit of time to talk about the progress that we've, we're making under Harvest Plus. So we're developing high iron and zinc pyramids for distribution in India. We will release our first varieties in 2012. We're multiplying seed and we will be doing delivery activities starting in 2012 in Maharashtra and Gujarat. We're developing high zinc rice for Bangladesh and India. Our first releases will be in Bangladesh in 2013. Followed, to be followed by India. We're developing high zinc wheat for India and Pakistan. We'll have our first releases of wheat in, pa in India in 2013. Now our products for Africa. We have high iron beans in Rwanda. Varieties have been submitted to the varietal release committees. We expect official release in 2012. We'll be del doing delivery activities in Rwanda in 2012 and then on. <coughs> cassava, we have a high pro vitamin A cassava, yellow cassava. We expect official release this year. We're multiplying cassava stems and we're, we'll be into dissemination in 2012 and 2013 in Nigeria. Maize, we have high pro vitamin A maize. We have five varieties submitted to the varietal release committees. We expect a fissure release in 2012. We're multiplying the seed and we'll have delivery activities in Zambia starting in 2012. Orange sweet potato has already been released in Uganda, Mozambique, several other countries. We've done pilot dissemination um, project there that's now been completed. Uh, we had a, there was a presentation on that in, a, in another parallel session yesterday. In that, uh, in that pilot dissemination of 24,000 households, we had 75% adoption rates. Uh, we were able to increase the intakes of pro-vitamin A for women and for children. The, the light yellow lines were their baseline vitamin A intakes and the dark orange is how much we were able to add to their, to their vitamin A intake. So there were quite substantial increases in vitamin A intakes. So what's the, what are the advantages and what's the niche for biofortification? Well, first of all, it's, it's cost effective as was recognized by the Copenhagen Consensus, a group of economists that were asked to identify the 30 most productive investments that could be made in developing countries. Three out of the top five were to fight micronutrient malnutrition and biofortification was ranked fifth out of the top 30. We feel that an investment of three to four hundred million dollars over 15 years under Harvest Plus can have benefits of tens of millions of dollars, economic benefits of tens of millions of dollars. I don't have time to develop the, uh, the arguments for that. 
Biofortification, as Lindsay emphasized, biofortification reaches the whole family, but it has the most benefit for women and for children because they're the ones whose requirements for micronutrients are the highest. It works best where women are farmers because it's women who are more receptive to the nutrition messages than are the men. It targets the rural poor. Biofortification starts in the rural areas, reaches into urban areas as the marketed surpluses get into the marketing system. So it starts at the opposite end as supplementation and fortification, and the, and the complementary strategies meet in the middle. It's a sustainable strategy because the costs, the research costs are front loaded. Obviously, biofortification links agriculture and nutrition, and Harvest Plus has a proven track record in bringing the agriculture and nutrition communities together over the past eight years. And then finally, I want to emphasize that it's a technology that's now on the shelf. After many, many years of trying to get the strategy started, getting the investments, now doing the breeding for the past seven years, it's now ready and waiting its technology on the shelf. And it will get better and better over time and have more impact as other varieties come out of the pipeline that are higher yielding and even higher nutrient values and as those varieties diffuse within the food systems. So thank you. Thank you very much, Howdy, for uh, this explanation on uh, the uh, rising food prices and what it does to the micronutrient intake and also to show us the niche for biofortification. Now, the next speaker is um, uh, Dino Kitting, who is the Director General of AVRDC, the World Vegetable Center, and no doubt we'll hear uh, what vegetables can do in this whole equation of improving uh, nutrition and human health. Dino. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Chairman, and I note many friends in the audience, and I appreciate your support. I read the Lancet series of papers with considerable interest, and there was a quote in there from one of the editors, Richard Horton, saying, after age two years, undernutrition will have caused irreversible damage for future development. Now, I think that is a, an issue, and therefore I'm going to confine my remarks specifically to um, young women and I believe that uh, Lindsay referred to something which I think that the Lancet series rather missed a trick on, uh, which is the importance of ensuring good nutrition for young women before they get pregnant, uh, not afterwards. The World Vision Health Program sets as their priorities for pregnant women adequate diet with iron and folate supplementation for kids breastfeeding with appropriate complementary feeding with adequate iron, vitamin A supplementation, etc., etc. The question is, what is that adequate diet? And I believe that that is something that we need to thank nature for because nature has provided an almost complete solution to this particular problem. And this is the solution. Something which provides a source of food that provides a whole series of multiple nutrient and vitamin and mineral mixtures which is fully available to us and which we in fact can lift not off the shelf but we can use immediately today. The difficulty is, is that for many people in today's world they're not eating sufficient fruit and vegetables. If your intake falls down to about 200 grams per head per day then things like child mortality rise very rapidly and undernutrition and stunting also occurs. And it's a very critical threshold uh, which we need to seek to avoid. And therefore, it's of paramount importance, I think, for us to ensure that young women get a good diet from a long time before they get married and consider having children. And what then is a well-balanced diet? Well, as far as AVRDC is concerned, I think we need to make it clear that we're concerned with a balanced diet and not something that is solely on vegetables. If you look now at the recommended nutrient intake for pregnant women in the first trimester, right at the beginning of pregnancy, that they need energy 
but the energy sources which they're usually using cannot provide many of those vitamins and minerals which are required for good development of the fetus. If you are a meat eater, you're certainly getting some protein, but you're not getting then many of the other things. The good thing is that pulses, and also that includes some of the green vegetables, are heavy in protein and many of these other things, but not particularly vitamin A. The embarrassing thing for me to announce to you is, is that the usual vegetables which we eat in our daily diet, cabbage, tomato, cucumber, etc., etc., actually have almost no nutrition in them whatsoever. Much of that good nutrition has been bred out uh, by the breeding companies in, in favor of uh, firmness, taste, color, all of these other things that we like, but the nutrition is gone. It doesn't mean they can't have nutrition, they just don't have it at the moment. But nature is kind to us because she's also provided a huge source of additional uh, vegetables which we can uh, uh, access, which are those on the bottom, which are absolutely nutrient dense and loaded with all of the nutrients and vitamins and minerals you could possibly want. But the tragedy is the amount of research on these particular vegetable crops is close to zero at present. And that's something that I hope that we can change as a result of this conference. Now, the World Vegetable Center, um, with the sort of Helen Keller example of which we helped precipitate to some extent in Bangladesh, believes that the answer to poor people getting proper nutrition is to grow their own. This is essentially a, a very small cost type of investment. A six by six meter plot in which you're seeing several replicates on the slide at the moment is sufficient to provide good vegetables for a family of four or five for a year. And all you have to add then is the basic rice or maize and potentially some meat and milk products and you can then have a balanced diet. The sort of things you get off that plot, normally you'd expect for me to show you yield data, you'd expect to show me economic data, but I'm not doing that because I don't want people to sell these crops, I want them to eat them themselves. So off this six by six plot, this home garden, homestead garden, whatever you want to call it, you can get, and this is now from large scale trials in Jharkhand and in the Punjab done by ABRDC with Tata founding, we can produce 75% of the protein requirements for people, well over 100% of beta carotene, and don't forget not all of that is available to humans and therefore you have to uh, take that into consideration. Same with vitamin C, about a quarter of the iron need. So if we have a complementary strategy with what Howie is doing, if you can add biofortified cereals to home garden legume production, uh, uh, sorry, vegetable production, then you have a chance to have a well-balanced diet without huge additional cost. But please note that you need to provide nutritional information, good recipes for these vegetables, food processing methods which allows the iron and protein to be available. So information and research is required. Each of these um, home gardens needs a separate distribution of vegetables according to people's tastes uh, and needs and can be then uh, geared up. Now the question then is, if we accept that this is a viable strategy, uh, where do, can people get seed? Well, the answer is very simple. You can get the seed from us at the World Vegetable Center. It can be either from the headquarters, from the gene bank, or from the regional offices. We have more than 400 species in the gene bank which we can call upon, which means that whatever environment worldwide in terms of the tropics you can come up with, I can find you a series of vegetables which will grow there satisfactorily. So we have a slogan now to go along with this idea, and I'd like to try it out on you. And our slogan is, not a green revolution, but a revolution with greens. And I believe that that is part of the solution now to the problems that we're having. I believe it can be scaled up very quickly. Um, but I have to say to my friends in the audience, thank you for supporting our work. But to those donors in the audience not yet supporting our work, one of the problems that we have is that my hands have been shackled by underfunding for too long, 
And if I'm going to really make a contribution to this type of effort, you have to release me. Uh, and if you do release me, then I guarantee we will reach millions of uh, undernourished families and we can do something about it quickly. Thank you very much indeed.